Okay, so I'm, I'm going to take like a more personal approach, not as much institutional. I, I think, or I hope, my university backs me on this. But I'm talking quite personally, and that that will be my my own personal, I don't know, pace during the last 15 years that I've been teaching online. There is something that Pep did not say that we are, as the Open University, we are only online. I mean, we are not the online branch of a face-to-face -face university, we are only online. So for us, going online was something that is on the design. So I'm going to speak about what comes next, or at least my concern, which is when I'm not there, what happens with my students. 95% uh, of our students are already working, they have their own lives more or less set. So what happens when I'm not there as, as, a, as, a, as a teacher, as a mentor, as something that is uh, going beside them? So this is my concern. This is my students, or this could be myself. I mean, I, I consider, as someone said before, that being a teacher is both being a, a researcher, being a teacher, and being uh, a student oneself or a learner. So, and I think that there are four things that I, I, I want to try that my students uh, uh, reach or achieve. First one is that they realize that there is a, a sort of a network, which I call it the topic, the discipline, call it whatever. I mean, it's the people that are working on their field. In my case, or one of my cases, it's e-government, for instance. So I try to make my, my students realize that out there, out the university, outside of Ishmael, who is very good in, in e-government, there are people that are talking and working uh, on, in e-government. But this another thing, this does not happen uh, uh, isolated, it happens in a context. Call it context, call it neighborhood. If it's e-government, it's libraries, it's the government, it's IT people, uh, it's civic centers. There are many people that n are not working exactly in e-government, which is the first network, but they are working with the same people that will have to deal with e-government, for instance. So one of the things that I want to try or that I want really to succeed in that is that my students realize that whatever they do happens in a context. And for, for me to do that means that I have to belong to that context too. I have to have uh, friends in the government, friends in telecenters, friends in libraries, friends on acknowledgements, call it whatever. Uh, but this not just happen just only a discipline and in a context, but in a way that is a methodology. So I use tools that I want my students to use that are not necessarily uh, confined to, to a discipline. If you use statistics or if you use uh, qualitative analysis, there are other people in other disciplines that are using that and that are making advance these tools. So again, I want to try my students to reach out and find out who are the guys that are using these same tools and be part of that network. And last, uh, they're not alone. So there are many people that are like themselves, working in, or working or doing research or learning this kind of stuff. And for me, it's important that this network of peers, it's, it's embodied in something, or it's not tacit, but it's explicit, because it helps them to know who they are, to diagnose in what stage they are, to realize or to define very well their own goals, and to set the path from their needs to their goals. And this is not only, but having a network of peers helps a lot on this sense of community and putting things together. Uh, this is the theory. So I want my students to realize that there are these four. You could drive five, or you could drive, uh, draw, um, draw uh, three networks. These are my one. But I, I, I'm trying to make them realize that these things. How do I do that? OK, I'm going to challenge all the institutions, the educational institutions, Challenge means not that I say that they are not valid anymore, but that they can be unfolded because we have new technologies, we have digital technologies, we have digital spaces or digital platforms that help me to unfold, for instance, what is a, an educational center. An educational center is like four walls at a given time. So going online means that time and space are no more relevant. So I try to tell my students, tell means uh, you can have a digital forum, and then we can get rid of time. Or you can have uh, digital access to a digital campus, and we can get rid of space. That's my idea of going online. It's not for the sake of many other things that have been said, but for me, it's 
that you can realize that you don't need to be at the same time and at the same place to learn or to work or to be a person or to be, I don't, I don't know, having relationship with other people, whatever. Second thing is the idea of classroom, of the cohort. Uh, we are used to deal with our students as closed groups in closed spaces. Uh, for instance, one thing that I do is uh, I teach through Twitter. Not only through Twitter, I also use Twitter. And the idea is not using Twitter because just because, but because there are many people using Twitter, for instance, in e government. The idea that they can go on Twitter means that instead of having like 20 people in my classroom dealing with one topic, it just happens, and it's a real example, that there are almost 200 people talking about that issue. This means that we build a community, even if it's very ephemeral or very trivial, but there's a real community out there, and it's a real one, which transcends the idea of the closed group that goes from course to course and subject to subject. They open up to other people, other institutions that are doing the real thing on Twitter. And Twitter is just an example. I will do more examples before, after, sorry. Another thing that I want to challenge is the textbook. Yes, we have done what everything everyone is doing, which is putting, uploading all the things on, on, on the virtual campus. But why not create a wiki altogether? If we want to discuss a law, for instance, the law on electronic commerce, why should I explain everything to my students? Uh, why should I point them to something that uh, some savvy guy has written? Why not themselves analyze the law and all themselves collaboratively uh, write their criticism on that law? That is. Means what for me means to send in the textbook. There's a textbook, there's a law, there's how to analyze a law, but instead of saying, look, this is the pros and cons of this new law that the government is trying to pass or that just passed, I make my students do that. And if it's openly, better. So we do that on Google Documents, we do that on wikis, etc. And many times we do that openly so that anyone can just comment. So the idea of to send in the textbook means that on the one hand, we can deal with real issues. And the second thing is that instead of, I mean, now that we have the possibility of doing that very quickly and very cheaply, that it can, anyone can contribute. The library is the compilation of these textbooks. What I mean by um, getting over the library means that, yes, there are some clever guys, just like Pep, that spend all their time putting things together. But I'm sorry, Pep, you are not the most um, relevant guy in e-government. I know you do your best. But there are many people out there that are putting things together. For instance, on SlideShare, if you go on SlideShare, there are many, 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 many examples of people that have uploaded uh, PowerPoints. Some of them are crap, but some of them are very good. So this is all the libraries. Not, I'm not saying that the, the, the normal library is a bad thing. I'm saying that we can unfold the traditional library and find other libraries, like SlideShare, like Delicious, and other places that I send my students not only to look for things, but to upload things. The best, maybe, the best library now with cases on e-government is my students' cases that are being uploaded uh, for the last 10 years on SlideShare. And now they, we have like a couple of hundred cases, which I'm sure no, no, any library has gathered together. So that's the idea of going beyond what was before. The syllabus, yes, we know, on, so September 1st, that it's in Spain, what we're going to talk about, but things happen. And why should we be sticking to what we planned on, first, on the first day? In my case, I engage or I uh, incentivate my students to create their own syllabus, proposing new things, proposing new resources on Twitter, on the issues, on, on discussion boards. And this is going to go to the exam. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, but why? This is increasing the syllabus. Bad chance, I mean, bad luck. If you want it to be uh, so lazy, you better be born in the Neolithic. Now this is the real world, it changes every day. So you don't have to learn all the things that we are uh, dropping on the table, just knowing that reality just goes on, even if you think that the syllabus is some close thing. That's the idea of going beyond the syllabus, that anyone can propose, and it's not only proposing things, it's that being aware that there are many sources of information that are very relevant, and when I'm not there, they have to know how to find these new places. And I'm not talking about the specific place, places. I'm talking that they have to know by, for every problem that they have or every issue uh, where to get 
the actual information. Schedule, uh, if it's uh, Monday at nine o'clock, we have to do this thing, no. If it's Sunday at 10 o'clock, or if it's uh, Sunday at 11 p.m. and the Italians are voting on something which might be relevant for everyone else, yes, you have to be learning that. But this makes of me a 24-hour student. Come on. Uh, again, if you want it not to be only a, a one-hour student a week, be born in the Neolithic. This is the new era. You have to be a constant student. It's not my fault. So, no, no, really. So I try to encourage my students to be aware of everything and to at least to have the antennas uh, set and be able to reinterpret all the reality and all the places that they are in, in Facebook, in whatever, in their own terms. Yes, it's tiring. Yes, they complain. But afterwards, they are grateful that they learned more. Yes, we can get, not get rid of the teacher, but we can get over the teacher or get beyond the teacher. What means going beyond a teacher? Well, if you are on Twitter, they will find like many other teachers. You will have people that are relevant, that are saying relevant things, that are relevant in their field, that maybe they will be their, their employers in the future. And they have to know who they are and in what places do they meet. So it's not only that the teacher is not only me. Is that the people gather in several places, in communities of practice, communities of learning, in hashtags or around hashtags, and they have to know and they have to be able to tell who is a relevant guy and who is not. And this empowerment thing means that you also are a teacher. If you share your things online, on Twitter, on SlideShare, on wikis, on comments, on blogs, you become a teacher too. And that is very, very good. That is very interesting and has proven at least to my students, or so they say, uh, quite interesting and enriching. Who assesses and who says what? So again, I try my students to have these monitoring strategies, meaning don't stick to the modules uh, on PDF in the campus, don't stick to what Ismail is saying, just do have a strategy on how, how and what to monitor outside. You have to be aware of your environment, especially if you want to know beyond content and you want to have skills or competences. You, we know that outside in the real world, people are more about, um, they value more knowledge, so how you apply information to real cases, rather than if you have a lot of information. So again, the idea of decentralized, not only what happened inside the campus, the classroom, the teacher, the textbook, the library, the syllabus, etc., but what is out there, and especially how you build your own uh, curriculum, how you build your own environment. If you're able to build your own ecosystem, your learning ecosystem, or if you are able to uh, self-direct your learning needs or self-direct your learning strategies. So for me, uh, as, a, as a scholar, as a teacher, as a mentor, as a colleague, what I try to do is not, not anymore, I, not, I don't succeed always, but I try to provide context to my students, which is something that normally individuals are very bad at doing. So I, I try to, from my own position, to provide context, to identify what spaces might be, uh, spaces mean not physical spaces, but what books, what people, what communities, what platforms, etc. what might be of interest of my, I was about to say children, my students, and for myself, and try to foster interaction, try to make things happen. If, it's, if I find that Twitter is a good place, I try to come up with a new hashtag to encourage them to be there. If it's slideshare, it's about a topic, etc. So I try not to, I mean, through assignments or through different strategies that the people find these networks and with their personal learning environments that they can reach out, that they can be part of these networks and in the future, that they are part of the networks. And if I'm not there, I, I cannot reach out, but if, I, if you take out one of these dots, which is myself, <clears throat> that they still can be learning, that they can still be part of the community, that they can still be part of their networks, that they can still learn by themselves with their peers, with other people talking about methodologies, with their environment, with their disciplines. And if I'm not there, at least I encourage or help them or drive them, draw them, uh, to a place or to a strategy which is sustainable without me. So these are my thoughts here for you to tweet them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ismail.